So I've been working on the relationship between law and Western militaries for some time, and I've been interested in, in notions of lawfare or legal encirclement and this concern by Western militaries that they're unduly constrained in operational realities by, by international law, by domestic law, and so on. And so that's been percolating in my mind for some time, and, I, and, I, and I've written on that. But my, my interest in coups uh, arose in a more roundabout way, and it, it had to do with the, with the chapter for the book that, uh, that Valerie mentioned in honor of the prosecutor of the ICTR, uh, Justice, Justice Jallo. He'd written a book in 2012 called A Journey for Justice. In this book, and, and Justice Jallo is uh, Gambian, and this book portrays a 1981 attempted coup in Gambia, Naturally, we're all intricately familiar with that particular coup. <laughs> uh, uh, on a very human scale, he writes, For several days the country was held to ransom by bands of roving rebels. The country was plunged into chaos, there was much violence, much loss of life, and indiscriminate destruction of both public and private property. And the book goes on to describe what a, a rule of law response to a coup d'etat uh, should or, or, or would be. In Gambia, this involved, among other things, fair trials for those charged with mutiny and other offenses following the coup. Uh, and interestingly, for, in, for those of transitional justice, when we think of hybrid tribunals, so mixed international and domestic tribunals, we often you know, think of, your, of the 1990s, the beginning of those. But in fact, after the 1981 coup, Gambia had a, a, a hybrid tribunal of international and domestic uh, players. So yeah, I think, could I, I say yeah? that um, I spoke to Hassan Jallo about yeah. this and, and Fatou Bansouda, the prosecutor mm -hmm. of the ICC, and she and he actually intersected when this was set really? up, huh. so that was the, for both of them the start of their careers. Interesting. In I didn't know. I didn't know that justice. she had a role in that. Yeah, she was very, very young okay. at the time. Yeah. Interesting. So, so I, there's all kinds of interesting things about this particular coup, uh, and and Justice Jalo's personal role in these post-1981 prosecutions, his removal from office in 1994 following another coup in Gambia. And his subsequent re-engagement with the, with the Gambian legal system make for a really good read, frankly. If anyone if anyone's, has a particular interest in Gambia or coups, I recommend A Journey for Justice. But one of the things that Justice Jalal's book did not do is really talk about <coughs> how you prevent coups. It was all about reaction. And, and, my, and, and, and delving into the literature a, a little bit more, I, I, I found that increasingly, that in the legal literature at least, and I recognize there's an interdisciplinary literature out there which is perhaps more, more empirically rich, that lawyers and legal scholars were looking at how do you deal with a coup after the fact and not looking at how you prevent them in the first place. So lots on the sort of fragilities of the rule of law post-coup, but how do, you, how do you make a rule of law, how do you make a country more resilient to a coup d'etat in the first place? So what I want to look at now is the method of constructing a system of democratic and civilian, and those are not necessarily the same thing, oversight over the military on a long-term basis. And the aim of uh, this paper is to offer some thoughts in that regard. I want to suggest that domestic or international rule of law responses to specific coups, or coups in a particular region, or even coups writ large, are necessary but insufficient steps towards asserting civilian democratic control over armed forces. A lack of democratic control and oversight of the military remains an ongoing global issue in both fragile uh, democracies, but also more resilient democracies, such as Canada. And one of the things I really want to stress, if, if, if there was one sort of takeaway or the, my elevator pitch, it's that when, you think, when we think about coups, we often pathologize them as being a global south phenomenon, right? Uh, and that's true to some extent. That's, we're not in danger of a of coup d'etat in Canada. However, what I would suggest is that there's a, there's a spectrum of democratic and civilian oversight over the armed forces, and that Canada is somewhere on that spectrum, and uh, Gambia is somewhere on that spectrum as well but it is the same spectrum and that we face similar challenges in terms of making uh, democratic oversight of the armed forces something that is resilient. Um, and I'll come back to that, but let me just say if, if anyone sort of says, well, that's not, you know, if anyone is immediately skeptical about that, think of the detainees issue in Canada. Now, regardless if you have how, of, of how you think that ultimately should have been resolved, what's clear is that the accountability mechanisms weren't really up to the job. Right? So the Military Police Complaints Commission, well, it was, it was staffed, first of all, by a, a Tory stalwart. And then when, uh, when his term was over, the Tories simply refused for several months to appoint someone else right, who would be looking at the detainees issue. Um, the parliamentary, uh, the, 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 there were various commissions going on at, very, at various points. Um, and we've never still, to this day, it remains unfinished business in my view. There's never been a thorough accounting 
for what happened in that whole in that whole situation. The Judge Advocate General right now uh, in Canada is uh, actually a man I, General Cathcart, who I have a great deal of respect for, uh, and he, he's, he's both a good legal scholar and, and, and a person of integrity, but one of his obligations every year is to report annually to Parliament on the military justice system. A couple of years went by where he just didn't do it, and he's currently subject to a complaint at the Nova Scotia Barrister Society uh, with respect to that. There's just a few kind of teasers as to what I'm, what I'm getting at when I say Democratic oversight of the armed forces is not simply a Global South problem, it's a worldwide problem. Um, and accordingly, we should, we should uh, more accurately conceive of coups as being on one extreme of a spectrum of democratic control, as a massive failure of democratic control. Now, let me first provide an account of what legal and policy tools have been developed to address successful military takeovers, and then argue that while welcome and important, these measures are bound to be of the closing the barn door after the horse has left variety until a broader perspective on democratic oversight of armed forces is considered. In the second part of the paper, I'll highlight briefly the emerging practice on maintaining resilient democratic oversight. And in particular, I want to discuss the role the legal system has to play in maintaining this oversight. Now, just a couple of caveats right from the start. There's no reason we have to have a military to begin with. I recognize that. Costa Rica, for example, got rid of their military in 1949. So I think it's important to say that there's, there's nothing inevitable about having a military. I also want to acknowledge that coups have a variety of, uh, of reasons rooted in colonialism, rooted in, in socioeconomic factors, and I don't mean to dismiss any of those. They're simply not the, the, the topic of, of, of my talk today. And, and thirdly, the third caveat I would make is that legal oversight, which is what I want to concentrate on, is not necessarily even the most important aspect of democratic oversight. Legislative oversight is, is hugely important. Uh, Canada could learn a lot from, from Britain in this regard, where, um, where, where defense committees have ex exercised much more scrutiny over the British Armed Forces than Canadian, than its equi Canadian uh, equivalent uh, has. Um, and what we're finding in Western democracies in particular is that executives overreach through militaries. Right? So rather than worrying so much about a coup d'etat in Canada, really what we're seeing is the executives using militaries to extend executive power. So legislative oversight is, is really important, as is the legal oversight. I want to talk about, and other forms of oversight will include civil society and media oversight. Okay, well, what does the response to coups look like today? Needless to say, Gambia's experience with military-led or inspired coups is not unique in Africa. Indeed, between the founding of the Organization of African Unity in 1963, and the end of the Cold War, over half of African countries had at some point during that period been ruled by a military government which had overthrown a civilian government. During the Cold War period, the Organization of African Unity was committed to a non-interference policy, and outside of the apartheid regime, not only in South Africa, but outside of apartheid regimes, because it came up in Rhodesia as well, of course, uh, anyone who, who governed the state was accepted at the table. Right? Didn't, it didn't matter what kind of thuggishness you engaged in with your own country, at the level of the Organization of African Unity, it was uh, all comers come to the table. Whoever happened to be sovereign at that particular moment, regardless of how undemocratically they came to power, was welcomed at the table. Now, in the post-Cold War era, the, the, the famous or perhaps infamous democratic breezes uh, went through Africa uh, and the Organization of African Unity, later becoming the African Union. And these or, this organization and, and its successor began to take increasingly firm policy measures against coups. As events in Mali and Guinea-Bissau in 2012, the Central African Republic in Egypt in 2013, and Burkina Faso more recently have revealed, however, coups and attempted coups are hardly Cold War relics in, on the African continent. It is also said that, uh, more positively, that coups are now empirically on the decline. What we're facing more are constitutional coups where people are using constitutional or quasi-constitutional measures to extend terms in office uh, and so on. Um, but democratic oversight of the armed forces, regardless of whether the situation is improving, clearly remains a problem in Africa. And I don't want to pathologize this to Africa. Uh, uh, that's important to note that as well. For example, um, coups in other parts of the Global South, Thailand and Yemen in 2014, uh, in, uh, you know, show that this is not an African phenomenon. And thinking more, close, uh, more closely to home, in NATO, in 2013, 2013 rather, there were even whiffs of a coup in Greece. And the threat of coups sort of continually hang over Turkish politics, another, member, another NATO member state. 
Now, traditionally, the international legal system was inclined to take the internal order of a state at face value. Whatever leader or group wielded effective control over territory would ultimately be dealt with by other states and the international community. And this is not necessarily an incoherent uh, position. Non-interference in domestic affairs is, after all, a central pillar of the United Nations collective security uh, system. At the same time, the traditional position placed no stock on the rule of law domestically. But the end of the Cold War brought with it incrementally and unevenly the rise of the de democratic governance school of thought and a different kind of reaction to coup d'etat. The international system's response to coups in Haiti in 91 and Sierra Leone in 97 were, were seen as indicative of a kind of sea change in how the international community would respond to these extra-legal power shifts. In the case of Haiti, the international reaction to the overthrow of the Aristide government went beyond traditional ambivalence or even non-recognition, and the international community asserted that the new government in Haiti was void ab initio, that it, that it simply never existed. Uh, and the Security Council authorized a forceful intervention into that country. In Sierra Leone, ECOWAS, the, organization of, uh, uh, the economic organization of West African states, physically removed the junta, which had overthrown the Kaaba government in a move tacitly condoned by the international community. Now, while there was undoubtedly a good deal of ad hocery in the post-Cold War, Cold War attempts by the international community to react to, to coups, the emerging practice of actively opposing coups was also manifested in new policy doctrines of organizations in the developing, in the developing South. So in Africa, the condemnation and rejection of unconstitutional changes of government uh, in the 2000 Constitu Constitutive Act of the African Union built on earlier statements of the OAU. And the high watermark in terms of African policy actively against extra-legal changes to the domestic order followed in the form of the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Government. This instrument not only prohibits further participation in AU sessions by unlawful governments, but provides several theoretically robust measures including prosecutions and sanctions to suppress coups. Now, so under, uh, under the charter, if there's an unconstitutional change of government, you're not welcome at the table. And so this, this, is a, this is a policy change at the level of the African Union. Now, despite low participation rates and problematic participants, um, it, it only came in, the, the charter only came into effect with Cameroon with its impeccable democratic uh, credentials uh, ratified. The Charter is a strong statement against business as usual with respect to coups on that con continent. In addition, to the, uh, in addition to the African Union model, the Charter also has precedent in the Inter-American system. The 2001 Inter-American Democratic Charter stated that an unconstitutional interruption of the democratic order or an unconstitutional alteration of the constitutional regime that seriously impairs the democratic order in a member state constitutes, while it persists, an insurmountable obstacle to the government's participation in OAS sessions. Again, coup, you're not welcome at the table. Now, the emergence of a new norm against coups and some robust examples of opposition to coups by the international community must be applauded. This is a good news story for the rule of law domestically and internationally. But there are several uh, cautions which must be made in welcoming this development. First, there has been an uneven reaction to coups by the international community, even in recent years. And think about the muted reaction to Egypt's military takeover uh, from the Morsi regime, as emblematic of that. While many expressions of a concern were issued by world leaders, some key players internationally were clearly re reluctant to call it a coup or to, uh, to, uh, to, su to suggest somehow the new government of Egypt was a legal nullity. Now, this first point about uneven reactions to the international community is an empirical fact. The second point is perhaps a, a normative one. Not all coups are equally bad, arguably. Some have limited legitimacy. One, auth one author has suggested that in calling for more nuanced African Union approaches to coups, he says, in several cases, first in Mauritania and in Niger, a coup had substantial democratic support. In other, coup, in other cases, a coup actually appeared likely to advance democratization. It appears that the African Union policy to systematically refuse to recognize regimes that come to power through coups, irrespective of the precise circumstances, is dangerous. One author has even coined the counterintuitive phase a democratic coup. I love that. It's kind of, in, my, in, my role of, in my current role of, as dean, I have to learn how to massage things linguistically increasingly. So I, democratic coup is something that I, I think <laughs> I'm going to use at some point. Speaking of a deanship, one of my first acts was to ban bottled water. So. Winter well, students, if you see this at some point, you can, you can engage in a coup d'etat. 
Another caution is that the lack of consistent approach to coups may be an inevitable feature of the international legal order. Another author has pointed out that the international system's continuing diversity of interests and values, let alone regime types, significantly impedes so fundamental a change in international legal relations as the systematic denial to coup regimes of the legal capacity to assert rights and incur obligations and so forth in the international order. And a corollary to that is that the focus on how to address coups takes the spotlight off coup prevention and leaves it on coup reaction. Well, let me turn now to what's promised by the title of the talk, and that's preventing coups. I want to turn to dem democratic oversight of the armed forces beyond coups. Let's look at how the usurpation of democratic authority can be prevented, and more fundamentally, how democratic oversight can be strengthened through legal institutions. Now, in one sense, the post-coup measures I mentioned with the African Union and the inter-American inter system are coup preventers, right? Because they theoretically pose uh, a deterrence kind of, uh, kind of approach. And furthermore, the African and inter-American instruments contain some provisions on strengthening democracy and the rule of law generally. What's missing, however, is specific guidance on how democratic and civilian control of the armed forces is to be asserted and specifically for the purposes of this paper, these instruments in the African and inter-American systems lack guidance on implementing democratic oversight of the military through the mechanism of the legal system. Well then, what do I mean by democratic oversight? From the start, let me say that there's no shortage of action in this sphere today. I gave you a couple of Canadian examples already. But demands for legal redress come from all sorts of, sor of sources. Soldiers themselves, for example, there have been claims brought as a result of inadequate kit. You send me to Afghanistan without the right, or, or Iraq, without the right equipment. I'm going to sue you. Um, I'm going to sue my own government. Civilians at home and abroad, for example, there was a case in the UK where uh, the family of a uh, beaten and killed hotel clerk, who was beaten and killed at the hands of British soldiers, sued in Britain. It's the Alskany, Alskany case. Um, and Detainees are another source uh, of, uh, of litigation as well. And these complaints are translated through many judicial and quasi-judicial structures. Courts, of course, but also ombudsmen, uh, domestic and international commissions of inquiry, coroners, and as I mentioned in the case of the current Judge Advocate General, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. So there are a variety of forums where these kind of claims are, are brought up. And a variety of legal regimes are implicated, international human rights, international humanitarian law, sometimes called the law of armed conflict, domestic constitutional and international uh, legislative instruments. Furthermore, these claims come across disparate spatial and temporal boundaries. Right? So, for example, uh, you know, British actions in, um, in, a, in, in various, <laughs> Britain's being sued all over, but for its various kind of neo-colonial wars, they're being sued, uh, you know, not only in London, but also these cases are going to Strasbourg and France as well, as well, and it's taking place now over, over a period of decades. While there are a good many claims, there's also been a great deal of resistance by militaries and their advocates to these new claims. An influential think tank in the UK in 2013 considered the judicial creep into the armed forces and argued that the customs and practices of Britain's armed forces are now under threat from an unexpected quarter, the law. Recent legal developments have undermined the armed forces' ability to operate effectively on the battlefield. Other terms for this judicial creep, which has been decried, decried by politicians, senior military leaders, and indeed some judges themselves, have included legal encirclement, legal siege, and lawfare. However, the reality is that the judicialization, or the, the law resistors, as I might call them, have more often than not won the day. Right? So at the same time as I'm arguing that we need more robust legal oversight, of the armed forces in order to say that we have democratic control. At the same time, militaries and their supporters are saying, there's way too much law. Right? We can't even operate effectively because we're always looking over our, our, our shoulders. And uh, you know, lawyers are, are threatening to take us to court in the, in the, in the red mist of war. We can't, even, we can't even react appropriately. Well, various reasons in my view for the unreality of these claims that the law is, is, is interfering too much include the permissiveness of international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict, where the, where the notion of military necessity holds great sway, the involvement of military personnel in the drafting of international treaties or domestic legislation which seeks to govern military action, 
distinct military justice regime, regimes, which, as I will discuss in a moment, um, keep themselves separate from civilian oversight to some extent, and just plain obfuscation and delay. Let me take another example of, um, of the UK. And you've been in Northern Ireland, Tamara, for, 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 six, for, for six weeks. So here's, a, here's a, maybe a, a, a relevant example. The Bloody Sunday Inquiry, which examined the actions of British soldiers in Northern Ireland in 1972, did not report until 2010. Right? So, uh, and, 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 even, and perhaps less well known is the fact that dozens of inquiries into deaths, allegedly at the hands of British security forces or paramilitaries related to the security forces, remain outstanding today, and many of them have no chance of ever seeing the light of day. Now that example is from the Northern Ireland and the UK, a functioning democracy with a functioning legal system. Again, to, to, to bring matters closer to home, uh, one can point to the, the whole detainees issue in Canada, uh, and, and I'm happy to discuss that perhaps in, in conversation. Needless to say, attempts to use the courts in fragile democracies or countries that the rule of law is weak have met with even less success. In other words, the occasional successes in holding militaries accountable for malfeasance in Western states should not be taken to mean that there is sufficient legal oversight of the armed forces in those states or, or more globally. So what would strengthening democratic oversight through legal mechanisms look like? There are many mechanisms, strategies, avenues for doing this, from strengthening the independence of military legal advisors to more globally instituting military ombudsman regimes. Uh, I will touch briefly on two such avenues in the remaining part of the talk. And the two avenues are both about the scope of civilian versus military justice systems. And both provide examples where there is recent, if very limited, progress being made. So first is expanding the scope of civilian judicial scrutiny. And the corollary of, corollary of that is reducing the scope of military justice. Well then, expanding the scope of judicial scrutiny. My argument here is that there should be no no-go zones for civilian courts acting within the widest plausible scope of their jurisdiction. The existence of a military nexus should not be a trigger to judges in Canada or elsewhere to formally or informally think of the matter as beyond, beyond their legitimate purview, as has so often been the case. The reluctance of courts to scrutinize military action, particularly when those forces are acting extraterritorially, the expeditionary kind of scenario, stems from a variety of reasons, and these range from a desire not to interfere in traditional understandings of executive prerogative, to the belief that operational realities of war fighting are not appropriate subjects for retrospective civilian scrutiny. In some jurisdictions, there's a well-founded fear that judges themselves will be targeted, and that's, and that's fair enough. And at times, judicial restraint has resulted in specific no-grow doctrine, doctrine. So for in, Canada, in, in the Commonwealth, for example, we have this idea of, of combatant immunity, that you can't sue the government for something that happens in the midst of a firefight. Um, you know, actions outside that particular battle context, perhaps, but not in the, in, not in the, in the context of battle conditions. Um, Non-justiciability non in the U.S. Is, is a doctrine there where courts have often been able to say, actually, we, we can't deal with this. This is a political matter. It's not, not for courts. Courts have also found other ways of sidestepping decision-making over military matters, including through narrow ju jurisdictional understandings of their power. We've seen a gradual, if, incre if incremental, expansion in the European, in the context of the European Court of Human Rights of judicial scrutiny. But this has, A, been incremental, and B, has not gone very far beyond Europe. Again, to come back to the Afghan, Afghan detainees situation in Canada, the Federal Court of Canada found that the Canadian Charter did not apply to the actions of Canadian forces in Afghanistan when transferring detainees from their custody to the custody of Afghan authorities, where they almost certainly uh, face torture. Similarly, in the U.S., courts have refused to extend the reach of habeas corpus to cover uh, detainees at Bagram Air Base. The U.S. Supreme Court said, well, Guant Guantanamo is kind of almost like U.S. soil, so we're going to extend U.S. law to there, but Bagram, that's too far away. U.S. law doesn't apply. No protections. You can't sue here in the United States. Now, I, I stress that to say qu that courts should abandon no-go zone thinking is not to say that courts should ignore operational realities of military life. The appropriate role of courts is to ensure that the military complies with domestic and international law and is respectful of democratic values. It's not the job of courts to attempt to civilianize the military. And having due regard for operational realities means, amongst other things, recognizing the unique demands of... Uh, that's, that was just... 
<laughs> I expect to see you come back through that door, and that just completely threw me. <laughs> Um, having due regard for operational realities means, among other things, recognizing the unique demands of military service, including the imperatives of discipline and command, and the presence of physical danger. Not all kind of contexts require the same kind of deference, however. For example, if a court is asked to judge a commander's targeting decision made in the heat of battle, perhaps greater deference is due uh, than, if the, uh, than if the issue is one of recruitment, or outfitting, or training, or procurement, or targeting by the air when there's, when there's time to adequately vet a target and so on. All right, so there's the first plank in my argument then with respect to how you, in, uh, with respect to the need to increase the scope of civilian legal oversight. Basically, judges shouldn't uh, defer to the military. They should respect operational realities, but there's no need to say, this is a military matter and will therefore have no um, will know oversight over it. Now the corollary is that I think we need to restrict the scope of military justice. In 2006, Emmanuel Decaux, the Special Rapporteur of the Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, and only in the UN system can you come up with these absurd titles, uh, submitted 20 draft principles on the use of military tribunals. The first and most basic of the Decaux principles is that military tribunals where they exist may be established only by the Constitution or the law respecting the separation of uh, powers. It must be an integral part of the general judicial system. Well, so far, so good, right? No special courts. You should have military courts which exist outside the judicial regular judicial structure and which can haul people in front of them using secretive procedures. I think we're all, we're all good there. I think it's, yeah, consensus around the room on that one, I, I would guess. Well, I think most, most militaries, including Western militaries, would have no problem with that. Similarly, they would have no problem with the other, with other DECO principles which address fair trial standards, the application of international humanitarian law, um, accessibility and transparency, and so on. None of these principles are new, as battles in 19th century France culminating in the Dreyfus Affair uh, show us, right? And the concepts behind the principles are already reflected in decisions from international and regional rights bodies particularly on the issues of independence of military courts and these uh, courts just jurisdiction to try civilians. Unfortunately, however, these deco principles, which I think offer a really good vehicle in terms of going forward by way of restricting the scope of military justice and similarly expanding the scope of civilian oversight, have been alternatively attacked and ignored. Well, some of the attacks have, have come from the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, one of the beauties of working for the government is that every time you give a talk, you, you, you're able to say, um, well, of course, these don't reflect the views of, of my employer. Sometimes they do, right? And that's, that's kind of, it's kind, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a clear thing. So several, I shouldn't say several, but uh, some Canadian Forces uh, lawyers uh, writing in their personal capacity have argued that the deco principles are, um, are dangerous. They say, first of all, that military tribunals should have the power to try civilians when those civilians are accompanying the armed forces. And I, I, I get, I get that some, to some extent. The other reason that they say the deco principles are dangerous is because the deco principles require a military nexus before a military tribunal can take jurisdiction over an armed forces member, right? So, let me give you an example. A military court should have jurisdiction over its soldiers when they have abandoned a post or where they have disobeyed the command. But for an action which is off base, entirely unrelated to their military activities, the deco principles would say you shouldn't, the military tribunal should not have any authority over this. So Canadian Forces lawyers and some very, and I should say our Canadian Forces JAG officers are, are, are extremely articulate and able uh, and they include a number of really good scholars, but they've, several of them, are, or some of them have argued that the deco principles are inadequate for these purposes. And interestingly, Supreme Court of Canada in a decision late last year agreed to some extent. In a decision called Moriarty, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously decided that there need not be a military nex nexus for military courts, Marshall, to take jurisdiction over military members. Okay? So there need not be a military nexus. The mere fact that someone is in uniform, uh, at some, you know, that someone is a, regular, a member of the regular armed forces, is enough for them to be subject to the scrutiny of military and not civilian courts. 
Now, interesting as a matter of policy, the Canadian forces in a couple of situations, notably family violence and drinking and driving, leaves these matters to the, crim to the regular civilian criminal courts. But for most other matters, or the, the bulk of other matters, they, they prosecute in military courts, regardless of whether there's a military ne nexus. And to some extent, I can understand the, the, uh, the argument for that. The argument is that, look, if someone is committing fraud in civilian life, they don't have the kind of integrity which we would expect of a member of the armed forces. So I get that, and I, I, I see, I see, the, I see the, the, the principle there. One of the problems, however, is that this lack of a military nexus more globally is indicative and, and uh, encourages military courts to overreach in terms of their, uh, their authority. So they go after, after dissidents, right? They go after uh, they go after political opponents and so on. So there's a Canadian angle on what I think again is 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 is, is a global a global problem. Non-governmental organizations and academics have made occasional reference to them, and there's the odd reference to these principles in judicial proceedings, but unfortunately they haven't become a central part of discussions about democratic oversight of the armed forces. Now, arguably, there's a global trend towards fairer military courts exercising jurisdiction only over military personnel and over matters with a strict functional military necessity, but this proposition that some have made lacks any empirical basis. It would be an interesting study to do if, you, if any PhD students are still thinking about changing topics. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, the, the absence of the Decaux principles, in the absence of the Decaux principles, there would no, be no single benchmark document or instrument to say, what should civilian oversight look like? There are attempts to breathe life into these principles. In 2013, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers sent a questionnaire to states on their military justice systems, unfortunately receiving less than two dozen responses, and prepared a special report on military courts. In her report, she called on the Human Rights Council and General Assembly to promptly consider and adopt the principles. In doing so, she noted that in many states, the primary purpose of military tribunals continues to be that of serving the interests of the military rather than those of society, and military tribunals end up constituting a weapon for combating the so-called enemy, enemy within rather than being a tool for disciplining the troops. If the Decaux principles were to be adopted by the General Assembly, this would represent an important milestone on the way towards entrenching democratic oversight uh, globally. Of course, implementation on a national level would be an even greater challenge, including in Canada, but the adoption of clear international norms would give domestic and international actors the first clear set of standards on restricting the scope of military justice. Well, in conclusion then, I've suggested that civilian courts need to expand their understanding of their role in military oversight. It's not good enough to leave it to military lawyers. Uh, in, in the same way that war is too important to be left to the generals, military justice and matters of civilian oversight are too important to be left to civilian ex executives and certainly not to the military itself. Similarly, I've, I've advocated restricting the scope of military justice, perhaps through, amongst other things, the adoption of the Deco principles. Now, whether these things will come to pass remains to be seen. In the absence of a, global, of, a, of, a, of a clear global trend towards greater democratic oversight of the military through the legal system, however, we are, under, uh, are unlikely to see an end to coup d'etat. Coups are not independent phenomena, and anti-coup standards at the international level, while welcome, will not work without a broader perspective on democratic oversight of the military, including through legal mechanisms. In other words, civilian judge, judges in Canada and more globally uh, need to step up to the plate in exercising uh, oversight. So that's it.